Good evening. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. It's good to be here with you to worship our Lord in spirit and truth. Welcome to those that are visiting with us. It's good to see you. Good to have you with us. Let's start our worship by singing our first song, Amazing Grace, a song that clearly celebrates how we were once blind in our sins, but have been set free by Christ alone. So let's stand and sing. So not too many notices. Um, obviously be praying for treasure seekers at Tuesday and Thursday. That's right, Sarah, isn't it? And Wednesday. Tuesday to Thursday, sorry. There we go. Um, normal prayer meeting tomorrow at 1, don't forget, for those who normally go and for those who are around. Uh, community groups this week and just various other things on the Friday email, do go and check those out. Um, and we are going to pray, but before we go to pray, just going to read these words from Ephesians. Ephesians 4, start at verse 21. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life 
to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on your new self, created to be like God in true uh, righteousness and holiness. Let's just come together in prayer to our God. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we just thank you so much for sending your Son to die on the cross for us, our sin. Lord, we recognize that we were lost and running away from you. And it's nothing that we could do to save ourselves, Lord, but we just graciously say thank you, Lord, for saving us and drawing us close to you. Lord, we thank you that we are now a new creation in you, Lord Jesus. Help us to see the rough edges in our lives that need to be um, sharpened, Lord. We, Lord, we do know them sins that we so easily entangles us, so easily grips us. Lord, I do pray that you would set us free from those sins, Lord, we pray by your spirit. But Lord, we thank you that we are, can all be here tonight in unity in Christ, that we can be thankful for your salvation work on that cross. So Lord Jesus, we just thank you for that. Lord, we also remember uh, the Treasure Seekers and Holiday Bible Club this week. Lord, we do um, pray for Sarah, for Hannah, and for the other leaders who are participating. Lord, we do pray that you would help, uh, especially Hannah, as she does a lot of the teaching. Lord, I do pray that you help her to uh, deliver those messages um, well. And Lord, that you would give those children uh, hearts to hear your word and to um, take it in, receive it, and that it would change their lives from this moment onwards. And Lord, we just thank you for the prep that she has done up to this point. And uh, we do pray also for the logistics of the, uh, the week, and we do pray that it would go smoothly. There wouldn't be any hiccups, Lord, but the, that it would... Um, be done to your name and to your honor and to your glory, we do pray. And Lord, we are so thankful for the many uh, ministries inside Christ Church. And Lord, we do pray for uh, the men's breakfast. And we thank you uh, that it is uh, being faithfully running for a few years now. And we do pray as it's restarted uh, this, uh, this month for this year. And we do pray for the guys that regularly go or uh, guys that want to start coming. Lord, we do pray that we as guys can be um, uh, drawn closer together, um, that we would be guys that will be um, men of God and that we would be changed by your word in study. But Lord, we can just have great fellowship together uh, through breakfast. So Lord, I do pray that would be an encouraging time in a couple of weeks. And uh, Lord, I do pray that you would especially encourage those who have thought about coming in the past but haven't been able to get there, that you would encourage them to come, Lord, we pray. And Heavenly Father, lastly for the, our church, Lord, we do pray uh, for the unity of our church here, Lord, we long to be like the, the early church in Acts as we've gone through in the morning services, and we do pray, Heavenly Father, that we would love and care for our brothers and sisters in a biblical way, and that we would look out for our brothers and sisters, that we would long to um, give up um, our needs for the sake of our brothers and sisters. Lord, I do pray, Lord, that you would bind us strong together in faith, Lord, and I do pray that we would keep you the center of our church, and Lord, that we wouldn't deviate from the truth, but that we would stand and hold fast to the truth. There's many Uh, churches that are falling left, right, and center, Lord. But we we pray and long to be a church to stand fast to your truth, Lord. As the culture rises around us and wants us to bend on certain truths, Lord, we pray that we won't and that we will stand firmly in you, Lord, we pray. And lastly, we do pray for our brother Nick as he comes up to pray for, um, preach to us, shortly. Lord, I do pray for him. Thank you, Lord, for him. Thank you for this uh, new job that he um, 
it started, Lord, we do pray uh, that it's been an adjustment for him to a lot of traveling and uh, a lot of adjustment to new way of life. Lord, so I do pray now as he comes to preach your word to us that you would give him a clear mind to be able to uh, preach uh, it faithfully, the text faithfully, and uh, that it would encourage us, Lord, here as we hear your words. So Lord, I do pray that you would give us hearts to uh, receive your word now and that we may rejoice because we have heard from the living God. So Lord, we do pray for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to, before our reading, we're going to sing two songs. Our first one, Who, O Lord, Could Save Themselves. As we sing this song, particularly think about the words in the chorus. And let your hearts rejoice of what Christ has done for us individually and collectively. But individually, uh, he is the one worthy of all praise. So let's remember that as we sing this next song in the chorus and Our third song will be, Only by Grace Can We Enter. Let's stand and sing. You're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes. You're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes. You're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes. You're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes. You're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes. You're the giver of can lift us from the grave you came down to find us let us out of death to you alone belongs the highest praise you alone can rescue you alone can save you alone can lift us from the grave you came down to
by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. Not by our human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. Into your presence you call us, you call us to come. Into your presence you draw us, and now by your grace we transgressions who would stand thanks to your grace we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb Lord if you mark our transgressions can we enter only by grace can we stand not by our human endeavor but by the blood of the Lamb into your presence you call us you call us to Mark Sands is going to come up and read God's word to us from Romans, Romans 6. Yes, uh, turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the book of Romans and chapter 6, and we'll be reading verses 1 to 14. And if you have the church Bibles, starts on page 1132. It's the section headed, Dead to Sin, Alive in Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin 
but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Thanks, Mark. Well, before Nick comes to preach to us, let's sing our second to last song. Um, It was finished upon the cross. So let's stand and sing together. My great opponent, fear once had a hold on me, but the Son who died to save us rose that we will be free indeed. Death was once my great opponent, fear once had a hold on me, but the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Yes, he rose that we would be free indeed. Free from every plan of darkness, free to live and free to love. Death is dead and Christ is risen. It was finished upon that cross. Onward to eternal glory, to my sin. be turning back to Romans chapter 6, to the passage that that Mark read for us. Let's pray together as we come to God's word. Father, thank you that we have your word open before us. We thank you that it is a glorious word. 
Thank you that it's the word of your grace. Thank you that it's the good news concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and all you have done through him for us and for our salvation. Thank you for victory that we have in Christ. Thank you for good news of pardon for sin, but also good news of new life, of freedom, of an eternal hope. And so, Father, build us up by your word this evening as you exalt Christ, as you set Christ and his work before us, and as you fill our hearts with him and help us to walk in newness of life as a result of his work and the word that we hear from him this evening. We ask in his name. Amen. We happen to find ourselves living in a, a time and age when a great concern for a, whole, uh, for a great many people is the whole matter of human and individual identity. Clicker's not doing much, but never mind. Who am I? is a question that looms large. Uh, and it is indeed a very important concern. For human beings, mere existence is not enough. I need to know who I am. So the world is asking a very important question. But if we follow the world in its answers, we will be led astray in a most deadly and destructive manner. For instance, one answer that is given is that my identity is derived from my internal desires. Look inside to know who you are. I need to, to in, examine the desires I find within my inner self to know who I am, especially when it comes to such matters as gender, identity, and sexuality. But the great flaw in that way of looking at things is the reality that we saw last week in chapter 5, verse 12, that sin has entered our world. Through the first man, Adam, sin has entered our world like some terrible virus corrupting everything, not least our internal desires. Just consider the appalling and horrific murder of Brianna Guy. Brianna, who was born a boy, but led, or, or, or we might say confused by his own internal desires, identified and presented as a girl, Brianna was brutally and sadistically murdered by Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe. And, and sentencing the pair, the judge in the case said that Scarlett Jenkinson was motivated by a deep desire to kill. Her actions were an expression of internal desire. Clearly, not all desires can be allowed to define my identity. Defining identity by internal desire fails to, to reckon with the confusing, the deceitful, and ultimately sinful nature of our desires. It blindly denies the reality of the human condition with deadly and destructive consequences. Something else the world says is that there are any number of identities, uh, as many identities as there are people with desires. But the truth that we saw last week in Romans 5 is that ultimately there are really only two identities. We are either in Christ or we are in Adam. Either our identity is defined by Christ or it's defined by Adam. We're all born in Adam. Uh, and what a tragic identity that turns out to be. For through Adam's trespass, sin has entered the world, and in Adam we are all made sinners, and we're bearing Adam's guilt, and we're sharing in Adam's corruption, and we're suffering Adam's penalty. And so we're living out our existence under the tyrannical rule of sin and death. And it is a hopeless and helpless condition. That's our human identity in Adam. The evidence of that identity is seen in the news headlines every hour of every day of every week. But praise God, another identity has been made available to us as a free gift. Christ has come, being the gift of God's grace. And, and grace offers us a new identity, a transfer from team Adam to team Jesus. Uh, and coming to Christ, we receive a new identity in Christ. 
Uh, and what a contrast. Made sinners in Adam, we are made righteous in Christ. That is to say, condemned in Adam, we are justified in Christ. Uh, and so where once we lived under the rule of sin that came through Adam and brought death, now we live under the rule of grace that reigns through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where we got to at the end of chapter 5. Our identity in Christ. But he does so in order to address a false deduction from the great doctrine of justification by faith that is so central to the gospel that Paul preached. If it were a true deduction, this would be a very great objection to his gospel indeed. Uh, and the issue is this. If righteousness is received as a gift and not earned as reward, what motivation is there to resist sin and to do good? Why should students work at their studies if they are not going to be graded on their performance? If, as a gift, they will all get A stars in every subject, why work? Why study? If, it's not, if the outcome is not performance-based. In, indeed, worse than that, Paul has stated in chapter 5, verse 20, that where sin increased, grace increased all the more. The more sin there is to forgive, the more grace is needed, and God's abundant grace was sufficient to that need. But if more sin means more grace, then chapter 6, verse 1, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase. If, if, if that is a, a true deduction from the doctrine of justification by faith, that we should go on sinning because then there will be more grace, well then that would be a very serious objection to Paul's gospel. It cannot possibly be a true gospel from God if it promotes sin. So Paul must show that the deduction is false and therefore the objection is groundless. And his argument follows, his answer follows in chapter 6, verses 2 to 14, and that is continued in the rest of the chapter. We're looking at the first half this evening. Let's break down his argument into six steps. First sight, it might seem quite complex. Ultimately, it's quite simple. Here is step one. We have died to sin, verses 2 and 3. But verse 2, in a sense, contains the whole answer that Paul will unpack and expound in verses 3 to 14. So shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, absolutely not, no way. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We are those who have died to sin. Don't you get that? He says in verse 3, don't you know, don't you understand this? Have you not grasped this, that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? If you don't get that, then if you don't get that you've died to sin, then you haven't grasped the gospel sufficiently. To be baptized into Christ is to be united to Christ, and to be united with Christ is to be united with him in his death. Since I am in Christ, what has happened to Christ has happened to me. He died, and so I have died. Paul's not, I don't think, actually writing here about water baptism, but the reality that water baptism symbolizes, that when I go under the water, it is a picture of the death I have died in Christ. As Paul goes on to say in verse 4, we were buried with Christ through baptism into death. In the symbolism, dead and buried under the water, I have died. In particular, I have died to sin. And in his, his book, Romans for You, Tim Keller helpfully lists five things this does not mean. Number one, it does not mean that we no longer want to sin. That is patently false. 
Number two, it does not mean we no longer ought to sin. Paul doesn't say we ought to die to sin. He says we have died to sin. Number three, it does not mean sin is gradually weakening in us that we are dying to sin. But that's not what Paul says. It is quite wrong to merely bury the dying. If someone is dying, don't bury them until they are dead. We are not merely dying to sin. We have died to sin. Uh, Number four, it does not mean that we have renounced sin. No, this death is not something that we do. It is something that is done to us by virtue of our union with Christ. And then finally, number five, it does not mean that we are no longer guilty of sin. That's true, but that's not what Paul means here. Simply restating the truth that we are pardoned our sins would not advance the argument at all. It would simply repeat the issue. No, no, Paul's meaning is that the person I was in Adam has died. That person, the old me that lived under the rule and the reign and the realm of sin is dead, no more. Dead and buried with Christ. That as surely as Christ died on the cross, so I have died. Not merely to the guilt of sin, but to the rule and the reign of sin, the whole dominion of sin, the whole shebang. And we're now under the dominion of grace. At the end of verse 14, Paul says that sin shall no longer be your master, no longer lord it over you, exercising dominion over you. He doesn't say it ought not to or you should not allow it. He says it shall not, it cannot. It is impossible that sin should exercise dominion over you because you have died to sin. Ah, but you say that can't be true. I still feel the pull, the attraction, the power, the seduction of sin every day. The answer here is Paul, or the answer to that, is that Paul is not speaking here of our felt experience, but of our position, our status, our standing in relation to sin. Matt, in his prayer, kindly referred to uh, the fact that I have a new job and prayed for me in that. I changed jobs at the end of the year. On the 31st of December, I was still an employee of the Sussex Gospel Partnership. On the 1st of January, that employment had ceased, and I became an employee of a passion for life, and nothing felt different. Same garden office, same computer, same desk, same chair. I I even went on a a conference for young preachers and gave feedback on preaching workshops, which I've been doing for the past 14 years as part of the old job. It was not an experiential change, but it was a change of status, a decisive change of status that does have and will have significant experiential consequences. And it's a change of status that Paul has in view here. We were under the rule of sin that reigned in death, but we are now under, this is glorious truth, we're under the rule of grace that reigns in life. And it's one or the other. You cannot have a foot in both camps. That is simply impossible. You are either in Adam or you are in Christ. You are under one rule and reign or the other rule and reign. You cannot be under both. If you are a Christian, you have died to sin. The old you that belonged to that camp is dead. In Christ, you have died completely to the rule and reign of sin. Step two, we have been raised to walk in newness of life. If we have simply died with Christ and and been buried with Christ, then there is no gospel here. If if Christ died and was buried, end of story, well, there's no gospel, is there? But Christ did not stay in the tomb. Christ could not be held by the power of sin and death. He was the Holy One of God. It was impossible for death to hold him. Simply not possible that his body should stay in the tomb rotting and decaying like every other stinking corpse. 
See, sin had entered our world and reigned in death since the time of Adam, ruling over every human being so that every life ended in death, apart from a couple of exceptions. You can work out who they are. A, a tremendous power, a gripping And Christ was raised through the glorious power of the Father to live and to die no more. But remember, whatever has happened to Christ has happened to us if we are in him. Christ died, so we die. Christ was buried, we are buried. Christ was raised, we have been raised. So Paul can say, verse 4, we were therefore buried. Oh, I think it's my word. <laughs> Verse four. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Raised, not simply to be alive. But, but to, to translate the end of verse 4 more, more literally, to walk in newness of life. That is to live an altogether different life, a different quality of life, one marked by newness. Not the old life, lived under the rule of sin and death, but a new life under the rule of grace. We have been raised to walk in newness of life. And, and then verse 5 explains this by making explicit our own resurrection with Christ that was implied but not explicit in verse 4. So Paul goes on to say, to explain verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. And people are often, as they come to that verse, they are often confused by the future tense. Don't be confused by the future tense. It does not indicate that Paul is speaking of a future event, our resurrection on the last day, but rather he is thinking in terms of a logical sequence. If I say, press the button, and the door will open, press the button and the door will open, the important thing is not the timing, but the sequence of events. The opening of the door follows the pressing of the button. So here, with union with Christ, union with Christ in his death must most certainly be followed by union with Christ in his resurrection. But that resurrection, our resurrection, must already have taken place if we are to walk now in the unison of life. We cannot walk in the unison of life unless we have received that resurrection. So, we have died to sin, we have been raised to walk in newness of life, and then Paul simply goes on to underscore the certainty, the sort of, see how the two halves of that are, are, are there in verse 5, yeah. or the two parts of that, and then the two halves of verse 5, and, and, and Paul simply goes on to underscore the certainty of these things, these two steps in his argument, in the verses of the so step three is this, to know the certainty of the death you died to sin. 
See how verse 6 begins, well, man, you can't see, but I will tell you that verse 6 begins with the word, for we know. For we know. There is certainty for the Christian. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free. <coughs> That is, my old self, the person I was in Adam, that person was crucified. It's not in the process of being crucified, it has been crucified. It is dead, it is buried. But what was the purpose of that death? It was that the body ruled by sin, more literally the body of sin, might be done away with. The Greek word there means to render powerless. Not to obliterate, not to cause it to cease to exist, but to take away its power so that I should no longer be a slave to sin. But what is this body of sin that, that <coughs> has been rendered ineffective? Well, I think to, to understand this, it's helpful to know that here in Romans 6 and 7, Paul, Paul views sin as something that resides within the body. It's not that the body itself is sinful, but even for the Christian, sin still resides within the body and loves to make use of the members of the body and the faculties of the body, from my hands and my feet and my mouth to my imagination, my powers of thought, every faculty of me. Sin still loves to make use of because it still resides in the body. Let me illustrate the point. This way. If you simply picture your body with all of its physical and mental faculties as a house, sin was once the undisputed master of the house, controlling every room. For you lived under the rule and the reign of sin. But that person that once lived under the rule and reign of sin has died, and so you have been freed from the rule and reign of sin, and sin is no longer master of the house. It has been dethroned, it has been disempowered, but sin still sort of, as it were, lurks in the basement, as an unwelcome intruder. And it loves to sneak into the different rooms of the house and use them for its own wicked purposes. And sometimes it may even run wild, rampaging through every room, but it can never again be master of the house. Not yet driven from the house, but it can always be banished to the basement. You are no longer a slave to sin. So know the certainty of the death you die to sin. Uh, and then step four in Paul's argument, know the certainty of your resurrection to live to God. So in verse 8, Paul restates the point he's already made in verse 5. He says, For if we die with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. And again, don't misinterpret. It misinterpret Paul's use of the future tense. It is our present life in Christ that is in view. We believe that we live with Christ now because we died with him. But again, how, how can I know the certainty of this? How can I know that I have a new life with Christ, such that I can walk in newness of life? Well, the answer is our certain knowledge of the resurrection of Christ itself. See verse 9, verses 9 and 10, explain verse 8. How can we know that we also live with him? Because verse 9, we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So in his incarnation, Christ entered the realm of death and sin. He never allowed sin to master him so that he actually sinned, but he, he entered the world of sin and death. Where he, where he experienced the sorrows and the, and the horrors of this sin-ridden world uh, and finally surrendered himself to death for our sakes and for our salvation. 
He bore the penalty of death due to sinners, though he himself was without sin. But when he died, but when he died, his whole relationship to sin and death to which he has subjected himself voluntarily, that relationship ended. And so he has nothing more whatsoever to do with death and sin. Death no longer has any mastery over him. He has nothing more to do with sin. And the life he lives, he lives in no relation to sin whatsoever, rather than the life he lives, he lives to God. And so no, because you are in Christ, because you are in union with him, because the life you live is the life of God. Know the certainty of your resurrection now to live a life a life to God because you are united with Him. And He is your life. And the life He lives for God enables you to live for God walking in the universe of life. So that's that's one to four of Paul's arguments. You have died to sin, you have been raised to newness of life, know the certainty of your death to sin, know the certainty of your resurrection to live for God. And so then now you both say yes. <coughs> death one. Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 11. See how there is only one identity that counts. It is your identity in Christ. And so Paul says, in the same way. That is, just as you know that Christ died to sin and was raised from the dead to the life he lives to God, in the same way, because you are in Christ, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Do you realise here is the first imperative in the whole of the book of Romans? Chapters 1 to 5, there hasn't been a single imperative. Here is the first imperative. Here is the first instruction. Here is the first command. And the command is to do a reckoning. That is to come to a logical conclusion regarding your new identity in Christ. Now suppose you, you, you get out your bank statements. <coughs> And you create a spreadsheet. For some of you, this might be a very depressing experience. But suppose you get out your bank statements and you create a spreadsheet and you do a, a calculation to see how much money you do actually have or don't have. Then you would be doing a reckoning. It might, in that case, be good news, it might be bad news, but you would be doing a reckoning. And the process of reckoning would not change how much money. You have. Doesn't matter how often you rework the spreadsheet, it doesn't actually change how much money you actually have. You could not create money by a process of reckoning. It would be clearly gain a clear sighted view, a clear sighted analysis of your financial position. And, and, and so here, as we come to verse 11, we are not trying to make ourselves better by some sort of force of the will. We are not merely imagining that we are dead to sin or pretending that we are dead to sin. No, we are reckoning with the reality of our position in Christ. We are dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the unchangeable reality of our new identity in Christ. And let's see how it has nothing to do with my feelings. Nothing to do whatsoever with how much I am wrestling with sin or not wrestling with sin on any given day. Nothing to do with how much or how little temptation I'm presently encountering. Your feelings, your internal struggles, neither the warmth of your heart towards God nor the coldness of your heart towards God, none of those things have anything to do with this reckoning. They do not define your identity. You do not look inside to know who you are. This has nothing to do with my success or my failure in resisting the pull of sin. 
It has nothing to do with what I have done or will do or could possibly do. Nothing whatsoever to do with my performance. It is all about the fact that I have been baptised into the death of Christ so that I am now dead to the rule and the realm of sin and death and raised with him as one alive to God. I do the reckoning. Step five. And so step six, the final step, present yourself to God as one brought from death to life. See how verse 12 begins with a therefore. Therefore, in light of the argument of verses 2 to 11, in light of that reckoning, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. So here we come to the application after all of the doctrine. Here we finally come to the application. Only now do we come to any action on our part. Uh, and the action that we are to take follows on from the conclusion that we were instructed to come to in verse 11. So please note how we have got here. We begin with Christ. His death. His resurrection, that is where we must begin each day. Not with ourselves and with feeling our own spiritual pulse. That, our own spiritual pulse, will be hopelessly determined by the quality of the sleep that we've just had, or the things in the coming day that we're worrying about, or whether we've got some cold virus or some other bug, or just had some good news, or just had some bad news, whatever. Then we begin with Christ. We begin with Christ and the facts of his death and his resurrection. And then we follow with the doctrine that is to be deduced from our union with him in his death and in his resurrection. And the conclusion that follows about our unshakable position that we have died to sin and we have been raised to walk in news of life. Our unshakable position regarding our status our eternally secure identity in Christ, and then we say to ourselves, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Do not let it take hold of the faculties of the rooms of your house and, and use them for its own wicked purposes. We are dead to sin, but sin is not eradicated out of us. It never will be for as long as we are in these mortal bodies. That is, in very great part, why we groan longing for the redemption of the body. Do you realise that is not merely that you groan longing for the redemption of the body because you are accumulating more aches and pains as you get older? But because sin resides in this mortal body. And you long for a glorious, immortal, resurrection body in which sin no longer resides. And only then will you be free from the battle with sin. But for now, as you live life in this mortal body, there will always be a battle. There is a fight to be fought. But there is no need for sin to master us. We can resist the urge of sin. We can resist the temptation of sin, the seduction of sin, the temptation of sin. And we are motivated to do so when we remember that we have died to sin. Not only are we dead to sin, we are alive to God. And so it follows that we must go on to offer ourselves, to present ourselves to God, put ourselves at God's disposal as those who have been brought from death to life. We are to be soldiers reporting for duty, ready for active service. And this, in fact, is the best way to stop sin reigning in our mortal bodies. It is to offer ourselves to God for active service in our homes, active service to God in our workplaces, in our communities, in the life of the church. And so 
so here we come to the, the chief motive and motivation of all this. It is not merely because I have come to see the ugliness and the emptiness of sin, or that I want to be happy, or I want to feel better about myself, or I want to feel less guilty or less ashamed, or I want to feel good, that I am successful in living the Christian life, or that I fear God's displeasure. No, it is that we understand God's whole purpose for us in Christ, that we have grasped hold of the entire purpose of our salvation, that Christ died, not merely that we should be forgiven, but in order to liberate us from that whole dominion and rule and reign of sin and death. That we should have nothing more to do with sin than to bring us under the rule of grace that reigns in righteousness. That we should be alive to God to serve his great purposes for his great glory. So allow me to finish by quoting from Dr. Martin Lloyd Davis, one of the great preachers of the British Church in the 20th century. I'm uh, preaching on these verses in. January 1959, 1959, mark that. Way back then, he said this. He said, We persist in thinking of it in terms of my feeling and my failure or my success, but Paul bids us to look at it in terms of service. When you fall to that sin, the real trouble is not so much the particular thing you have done or the badness of the things, of the thing. That is important, I agree, but there is something much worse. It is that you, for whom Christ died, have allowed sin to use a faculty that is in you. That is the way to look at it. Holiness is a matter of service, not of feelings, not of subjective moods and states, not a matter of experiences. We are meant to serve the living God with the whole of our being, and no part of us is ever meant to be used and must not be used in the service of sin. We must not fraternise with the enemy. That is the New Testament way of teaching holiness. What most of us need is not a clinic, but to listen to the sergeant major drilling his troops, commanding them, warning them, threatening them, showing them what to do. We must look at these things in terms of God and his glory. And the great campaign which he inaugurated through his son, the son of his love, and which he is going to bring to a triumphant conclusion. The thought then that should be supreme in our minds is that it is the king and his service that matters, and that what I must be concerned about is not so much the condition and state of my soul as my relationship to him and my value to him and my value in his kingdom. Let us get rid of the flabby, sentimental idea that is more with interest in ourselves and our desire simply for something to help us. Let us get rid of that approach altogether for it is unscriptural and wrong. Let us look at the position rather in this manly, strong, positive manner in which the Apostle puts it here, as indeed he puts it in all his teaching concerning this matter of sanctification everywhere. It is only as we look at it in this way that we shall see the privilege of our position. Sin will then become unthinkable. We shall not allow it to reign in our mortal body or yield any of the faculties our faculties or members as instruments of unrighteousness and sin. But positively, we shall yield ourselves unto God and our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Thanks. Shall we go on to the grace made in peace? By no means. We are those who have died to sin.
words being stepped on to a screen for entertainment or music to sing to. One of them is taking plans to the darkness to respond to God's work and perhaps two, three, four people can lead us in prayer in the thanks of such a great salvation and <coughs> good news of our sanctification and the of Father, thank you for this powerful reminder of the truth of our faith that we have been saved by the death of Christ. And through the death of Christ, the death of the sin within us, the curse of the foot, uh, the very clear uh, let the spirit remain with us.